Well, we'll be looking in God's Word, and you have a miracle in your hand. One little verse. If you have this little verse, I like to put it on pieces of paper. Years ago when I worked at a secular job, and it was a struggle to be a Christian in a secular world, I'd always keep scriptures in my pocket. And when somebody would yell at me or something wrong would happen, I'd just, oh, okay, that's how I should behave. And I, I just... You, Meditating and keeping scriptures close is really a good thing to do. So keep this with you all week long. We'll be looking at John 5, 24. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask for the miracle of your presence with us. Open your word to our hearts and let that be a miracle in Jesus' name. We have something called the miracle of truth. Truth's a miracle because God is a God of truth. The definition of miracle really is something outside this natural world that enters. And only God is outside of this natural world. Isn't that correct? When in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Everything in the middle is from God. Nothing exists outside the heavens and the earth. Only God. And God can jump in and cause a miracle to happen. And uh, really, a true miracle comes from God. And we wouldn't want any other miracle apart from God to happen, would we? There's a lot of false miracles in this world. We only want a miracle that comes from the throne of God. And wouldn't it be miraculous if a miracle actually happened? That'd be miraculous. Well, we have a miracle. Jesus took on a body. He lived eternity without a body. He suddenly took on a body, that's all planned, and dwelt among us. Now he has a body for the rest of his life. That's a miracle. Then not only did he come to this earth to be with us, he brought God's word to us. In fact, he's even called the Word of God. So when we hold the Word of God in our hand, we are holding a miracle. Jesus is a miracle. And we have the miracle of truth. Talk about media. Media stands in the middle and mediates. We have truth that will mediate for us. Let's read this little. If you want to read it out loud, you can. John 5, 24. I tell you the truth. Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned, he has crossed over from death to life. What a miracle that is. We have this miracle of truth that's alive. It's a living truth. Jesus said, I tell you the truth. He came to this world to bring God's truth, something this world needs desperately. See, the devil started out telling lies, didn't he? In fact, he's called the liar. That's one of his titles. He mediates lies. That's his job. He's the king of hype and sensationalism. He's the king of error. He's the anti-truth. Here's what Jesus said about him. One little comment in John chapter 8, and verse 44. Satan is a murderer from the beginning. See, lies bring death. Truth brings life if the truth's from God. He's a murderer from the beginning. Didn't he kill all of creation? Death entered in. Genesis 3. It's a pattern. We live it. He was a murderer from the beginning and, and holding, not holding to the truth. For there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language. For he's a liar and the father of lies. I mean, that's a powerful little verse describing the liar, Satan. Now, there's a rule in logic. If something is true... Something has to be false. This world likes to say, oh, everything's true, as long as you follow what we do. But if you don't, you're in big trouble. See, this poor lost world likes to pretend sometimes that everything is true. It's not true. If there's truth, there has to be false. You have to be able to compare true and false. They say, don't test what we claim. We don't want you to test our truth. Don't test it at all. Well, there's a battle for truth in this land. In fact, when Paul was describing the gospel, he starts out in, in Romans 8, three or eight beautiful chapters giving the full description of the gospel, starting in verse 1. And here's how he interprets the world's uh, relation to God and truth. They exchange the truth of God for a lie. That's Romans 1, 1.23. They exchange the truth of... Why would they do that? Well, because they're following the liar. 1 Thessalonians 5.21, Paul said this, test everything and hold on to the good. See, truth is good. The lies are not good. Avoid every kind of evil. Test everything. 
So lying can be a little bit tricky, and it's not often seen as a lie when the lie is given, because we have this thing called ignorance and denial that kind of work together. Our whole nation's locked in this. Anyone who doesn't know the Lord is born this way. We're in ignorance and we're in denial. We're doing just fine. Everything is going to work out okay. We've been trying for 6,000 years. Just give us a little more time. We'll figure it all out. It's the G3 syndrome. Genesis 3, the whole world's got it. Yeah, we'll get it figured out. That's lying and it's denial and it's ignorance. But there's also just plain lying, just out and out lying. We have to protect our brand. Have you heard that before? We have to protect our brand. We don't want the truth coming out and wrecking our brand no matter what happens. We don't want Hollywood to people to understand what's going on in Hollywood and what it stands for. And uh, popularity is king. Fame must rule. Follow the money. I mean, you know, on and on it goes. Oh, the poli politics, the politics. The, they'll mediate for us until we die. The, the lie, the lie. Notice something very spectacular and miraculous about this little verse in John 5. It's Jesus' words. And he says, I tell you the truth. Now, I don't know what translation you have, but in Greek, I know, I know they translate stuff in English to help us. I wish you would have left the Greek in there. Because you know what it says instead of, I tell you the truth? Some of you may know. Amen, amen. Two amens. He said, and that's a powerful word, amen. That means the truth. It also means, may it be so. Amen, amen, I tell you the truth. In fact, Jesus began his seventh letter to the church of Laodicea. We're studying those letters in the book of Revelation on Wednesday night. And this is the last letter, seven for completion. And really, here's how he ends that letter. And really, it sums it all up, all these letters that he wrote to all the churches in the world. These are the words of the amen. He's the amen. Jesus is the truth. These are the words of the amen the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. He is the amen. In fact, I think it's in your notes in Isaiah 65, verse 16. Two times, not one little verse, God is called the God of truth. Again, in Hebrew, though, the word is amen. It's the same word as Greek. They use the same word, different letters, but it's the same word. He's the amen. God is the truth. So, ladies and gentlemen, we have the miracle of truth right with us in Jesus Christ. He entered this world to bring the gospel truth, the good news. Isn't that great? We, we're holding on to the truth. It's no, it's no accident. In fact, the gospel is really the only thing on this earth that has not only the correct diagnosis of what's wrong, but also the remedy and what, two little simple verses that really explain it is Romans 3.23 and Romans 3.24. Romans 3.23, all have sinned, all, isn't that all? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's the diagnosis. Dia meaning a cross. Gnosis means knowledge. God sees a cross. Diagnosis. And here's the remedy in the next verse. But we are justified freely by God's grace. Justified means made right. Freely it means we didn't pay the price. It came through Jesus Christ, through his grace. We are justified freely by God's grace through the redemption, the buying back, the salvation through the redemption that came through Jesus Christ. Remember when Jesus was born, the angel told Mary and Joseph, you can't name your child. We will. God is, and he's going to be called Jesus, Yahshua, Yahweh saves. And that's what he does. And this is God's plan. So the gospel comes directly from the amen, from the truth. Now, uh, this is how G Jesus concluded his letter to the Laodiceans, verse 20. That's how I, I, he began his letter. That's what I read at first. I mean, that's how he began. Here's how he ends it. Here I am. He's offering, us to the, he's offering himself to the whole world. Revelation 3.20. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. He's knocking on everybody's heart. We've just opened the door. I'll come in. That's what he says. Behold, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone, that's anyone, hears my voice and opens the door, it's a, it's a prophetic way or a figurative way of saying, say yes to me. Open the door. 
I will come in and eat with him and he or she with me. It's, it's table fellowship in that culture. If you wait with somebody, it means you're friends. Remember, uh, Peter got in trouble for eating. And eating uh, he wouldn't eat with the Christians. And he was eating with the other people, and Paul got him in trouble. You can't have table fellowship with those people? What's wrong with you? This is, this is a way of saying we will be one with Christ. And he'll answer that door, that, that, that verse, for anyone that says yes and enters in. Fellowship is restored. Now, is it really true? Yes, it's true because it comes from the amen, the truth. He is the amen. Now, how many barriers do we have to the miracle of truth? This world does not want this truth to enter in because they're lost. And that's really the G3 syndrome. Well, I've got this doubt. I've got this problem. Uh, we have the media mediating truth for us. I got to believe what's on the TV or, you know, what's famous, uh, don't, and the media says, don't listen to us or else. And they pay a penalty. What does God's truth say to us? He tells us now, I've given you the truth. I want you to believe it, to receive it. When you believe it, you're, all, you're entering a miracle. Truth is believed. In other words, you are trusting. You are trusting in what God gave. And here's where it is in John 5, 24. The amen... Jesus, the truth, gave us this. Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me. Four miracles in that little phrase. The first one is this, the miracle of inclusion. Whoever hears. It's open to everybody. It's not left out to anybody. Now, I know we have copyright laws. We should have copyright laws to protect words. We have to protect our words. We own them and we, you know, make a living off them. It's a good thing and it makes sense. Keeps our words safe, copyright laws. Well, who owns the copyright to God's word? God does through Jesus Christ and he has opened it for everyone. He wants everyone to hear in his word. It's open. Whoever hears. Talk about the miracle of inclusion. This whole world is, is full of racism and uh, left and rightism and... Uh, Crazyism and uh, one is, I mean, all the isms, but God says, no, this is for anybody, anybody, whoever hears. It's a miracle. So believe and receive. The second miracle is this we have God's word. Whoever hears my word. Remember, I always say God's word is a miracle we can hold in our hands. When you hold the Bible, you're holding a miracle. When you really study how it's put together and how it has survived and what it says and, and the origin from it and everything, it's a miracle. Now, once in Israel's history, you can read Israel's history in the Old Testament, there's, there's pictures of Jesus all through there. And there's pictures of God working through people that really didn't want him because, you know, they're humans and whatnot. And he says, you know, I'm going to bring, I'm going to send a famine to you to wake you up. And, you know, they had to suffer a lot. A famine. He's trying to get them to pay attention to his word. A famine is what no one would want. And here's what it says in the book of Amos. I think it's a third, it's a third one in the minor prophets at the end of the Old Testament, the 12 minor prophets. Amos 8.11 says this. The days are coming, declares the sovereign Lord, when I will send a famine through the land. Not a famine of food or thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. Wow. Men will stagger from sea to sea. Kind of sounds like our country right now, just struggling. Men will stagger from sea to sea and wander from north to east, searching for the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. Wow, they had no idea that God's word was so important that it's going to destroy the nation. Help, our lives are collapsing all around us. We're lost. Our culture is becoming more and more lost. And where is God's word? Well, we've made it illegal. We've uh, called it hate speech. And then things are happening. So God has given us really the gift of his word. And, and to be healthy is to hunger for his word. You know, and the doctors all know this and medical people, if somebody loses their appetite, it's unhealthy. You have to have an appetite for God's word. If you don't, something's wrong in your relationship with God. You have to have an appetite for his word. And we can feast on God's word now. And we'll be well fed. So, that, so God's word's a miracle. Here's the third miracle. It's just belief. 
I tell you the truth. Amen. Amen. Whoever hears my word and believes, trusts. See, belief is the most important miracle on the face of this earth. People can be healed and all kinds of things. But if they don't believe in Jesus Christ, they're lost forever. Belief, trust is important. But this world doesn't get it, you know. If you carefully study 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse 18. It's, I probably put that in your notes, I think. 1 Corinthians 1.18, go through all that rest of the first chapter, then get 1 Corinthians 2 all the way through chapter 2. Those two chapters, starting in verse 18 and chapter 1, explain the situation about belief and unbelief. So 1 Corinthians 1.18 starts out like this. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. The message of the cross is this world will mock it. It's foolishness. And he goes on explaining it for two whole chapters. And here's how he ends it. But those who are being saved, those who are saved, have the mind of Christ. So he starts out with this foolishness. Suddenly we have the mind of Christ. This world has no idea what we have. So belief and trust is so important. It's a miracle. The fourth miracle then is the object of our belief is in God. I tell you the truth, whoever whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me. This is not faith in faith. It's faith in a person. It's faith in a deity. It's faith in a, in, in a personality. It's faith in a living being, God and Jesus Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit. See, this world sometimes think, well, if I don't have a feeling and I don't have this, you know, jumping all around and something must be wrong. No, that's faith in faith. But faith in a person, you're going to have feelings go up and down all the time, but you're still trusting in God. Trust in his word. He will teach you. In fact, God planned it since the creation of the universe. Genesis 3, the first gospel, 3.15. The seed of the woman will crush Satan's head. In other words, God had planned to send Jesus, his Messiah, through a woman. Now, you know, there's no such thing as seed of the woman, but it's a miracle. It's a virgin birth. Through the seed of the woman, Satan, I will crush your head. Genesis 3.15. So you get thousands of years of human history go by. And, and uh, really, you can sum, you could sum up the first gospel in Genesis 3.15. Then I like to look at John 3.16. I like to put those two together. John 3.16, God so loved the world. How do you measure that? God so loved the world that he gave. It's a, it's a gift. His one and only son. He was a love offering going up, that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him, whoever, will not perish, but have, possess, own, copyrighted the everlasting life. It's a miracle. Belief is a miracle. The door is open. Jesus shouted from the cross. I'm sure we all remember those last words. It is finished. Tetelestai in Greek. Tele means going all the way to the end. Telescope, telegram. To tell us, die. it's finished, it's done, complete. The price has been paid. He didn't shout that from the cross by accident, did he? He planned that. And when, as soon as he shouted that, you know what happened to the temple curtain? Remember that? It tore from top to bottom. Go on in now. You don't need the priesthood and all that stuff. It's done. Now the way is through Jesus Christ. So the gospel is a miracle. You have that little miracle in your hand, John 5, 24. I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He will not be condemned. He's crossed over from death to life. The miracle of the gospel starts out, you could say, with our position. We've been placed in Christ. It's nothing we earn. It's God's point of view for us now. You, we, are, we were born in Adam, naturally. Now we're supernaturally reborn in Christ. So we're removed from Adam and placed in Christ. It's a position. We have eternal life. And notice it's present tense. You've already got it. I don't feel like it very much. Well, don't, don't look in the mirror in your heart. Look in God's word and trust. Bow the knee. So any believer has this position. Now anyone not in this position can't make this declaration. That's right here in John 5, uh, 24. Jesus himself proclaims this as the truth. He's the amen. So why would, why would such a proclamation have to be proclaimed? Because we need to understand what we have in Christ. 
Now, life came to an abrupt halt at the fall in Genesis 3. And we all inherit that fall. We inherit it. We didn't earn it. it we're just born that way. We're cut off from a relationship with God because we're born in Adam. But once somebody in this world doesn't understand that reality, this world is lost. Just like Adam got kicked out of the garden and, the, and now all of a sudden, everything, read Genesis 4, it all started. Genesis 4 on, did nothing but problems. This world still has that, but doesn't understand why. But once you get saved, you go, now I get it. Isn't that true? Now I see what's going on in this world. We understand. But those born in Adam do not understand that four-letter word, sin. It's a cuss word to this world. They don't want to talk about sin. <laughs> Death entered to this world through sin, but God's gift of eternal life comes from anyone in Christ. He died on the cross to forgive us and cleanse us from our sin. Now, what we really have is the miracle of God's justice, not self-justification, because that's dangerous. This world is full of self-justification. No one can justify themselves before God. But because we have that position... Because he has justified us. That's the second miracle. We will not be condemned. In other words, the law will not condemn us anymore. The curtain is torn. Go right on in through Jesus Christ. Now, I know the world says, you probably heard it before, we don't judge. God doesn't judge. You ever hear it? I mean, they like that for some reason. We, God doesn't judge. That shows how lost humanity is. They make judge. This whole world is full of judgments. Why do we have all the wars? Why all the arguing, the name calling, the finger pointing, the rioting? It's, the, it's self justification. We know what's right and you don't. At the second coming of Christ, this whole world's going to understand this. The whole world's going to say, now we understand justice, but it'll be too late. If they're not in Christ. It's the second coming of Christ, it's going to be too late. Here's a little secret. The moment a person dies, the world doesn't know this, they're going to meet God. And they're either going to know, gee, I'm not in, I'm in Adam, I'm not in Christ. Uh-oh. Or they'll be with God, gee, I'm in Christ, praise God. I mean, we should already know that now, but there's going to be one or two. With God will be a blessing and all will know. Those that don't have God will be in Christ. There'll be a curse, you could say, the opposite of the covenant. Now, I've officiated a lot of funerals. And uh, the, when it's a funeral for a non-believing person, it is not the funnest funeral. I'm, it's, I always give the gospel in it, but, you know, uh, but if it's a funeral for a saved person, there's always hidden joy there. And some of them even want to just celebrate and just, just praise, even though they're sad. They know the reality of life and death. So today we're living really in the age of the miraculous. Uh, we're living not condemned by the justice of God, it's a miracle. We have God's justice. Justice means to make something right. And we've been justified, lined up according to God's word. And really, it's the miracle of salvation. <clears throat> he will not be condemned, if you believe. He has crossed over from death to life. Notice this is past tense. He crossed over. It's already happened. It's done. You've crossed over from death, being in Adam, to life. Being in Christ. We went through that door. Praise God for that. So anyone in Christ has, lives a miracle. We are a living miracle today. I know we don't feel like it sometimes. We can get discouraged by this world. But we're living a miracle. We want more to have that miracle. The new life starts now. I love what 2 Corinthians 5.17 says. If anyone is in Christ, well, that means you're not in Adam anymore, right? If anyone is in Christ, you're in that relationship, you're a new creation. What? Yeah, we've been made new. We're born again. If anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Now, first creation was pretty good, wasn't it? God created the universe, and scientists are still trying to figure out what, how it all works. It's so organized. and If it wasn't organized, they couldn't study it. The reason they study it, because it's so organized and the complex, and they can't figure it out. And what if they studied the new creation, the new creation that's in us? They should do that and see what we have as believers. It's a miracle greater than the universe. The universe is going to disappear. God's going to bring a new creation, just like we have in our hearts. 
That is a miracle. So instead of looking at the mirror or looking at our own feelings, look in God's Word. Let the miracle of God's Word take this little verse we have on this piece of paper, wherever it is locked. I've lost it in here, but oh, here it is. And meditate on this all week long. The gulf that we cannot cross. The rockets can reach all kinds of places in creation, but they can't go across to God's holiness from our unrighteousness. We have... I mean, in this world, we've got people who are famous, people who are rich. They think they've got it all. They have the media elite. They have nothing without Christ. Nothing. All anyone has in this natural world is the trench of ugly sin, and they can't cross over without Jesus. But praise God that Jesus is the truth. I tell you the truth. Amen, amen. Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me, has eternal life. He will not be condemned, but has crossed over from death to life. May we memorize, meditate, and live this blessing all week long. Let's bow our heads in prayer. This worship team comes up. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the miracle that we have in you, O oh God. Help others, Lord. If there's any way we can share your faith, your uh, truth with others, help us to do that, Lord. And we pray for our nation that you'd bring a revival in the United States of America, that your truth would no longer be illegal. But, you, Lord, you've made it legal. It's, it's justice. Bring it to us, O oh God, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.